Yeah. All right, well, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Anton Kudakin, the director of the Carmel Institute of Russian Culture and History at American University, uh, associate professor at the History Department. It's my honor to present to you our distinguished uh, speaker and author, a man who uh, has uh, a career that uh, goes above and beyond uh, history. He's got two novels under his belt, One Night in Winter in Sashinka. He has a biography of Jerusalem. Um, he has worked for things that have been produced for television, and he's got uh, now four uh, very interesting books on Russian history. The first one was Catherine the Great and Pytomkin, uh, then Stalin, The Court of the Red Tsar, uh, Young Stalin, which I've assigned to my students and who have enjoyed it immensely because in addition to being prolific, he's also a fantastic writer, as many of you know if you've read the books or will find out when you read the Romanovs. And today, uh, we're dealing with the fourth installment of the Russian history series, if I may call it that, uh, which is uh, a book dedicated to the Romanovs themselves and the spectacular history uh, infused and saturated with uh, uh, sex and violence and personal betrayal and political intrigue rivaled only by the Republican Party, I suppose. <laughs> Wait, no, no politics, so uh, I take all of that. Uh, so, but it did, it did connect. All right, so with that uh, uh, introduction, um, his books have uh, been translated into over 40 languages. He's also the only person I know who writes about Russian history and has also interviewed the Spice Girls. So um, if you think that's presentism, well, girl power was what the 18th century was all about in uh, <laughs> Russia, when you come to think of it. So everything is uh, connected, past, present, and uh, future. Um, we decided to do this in the form of, uh, of a conversation about the book. So, Simon, let me open by asking you about how you decided to handle this topic, because it's 304 years, and it is a big chunk of history. Well, first of all, let me say, it's great to be here. Thank you for doing this for me. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, lovely to have you here. Thanks so much for coming. And how amazing to be in this, this extraordinary house where Catherine the Great and Peter the Great and all sorts of other Romanovs are actually in residence permanently <laughs> uh, to this day. Um, I feel quite at home. Um, so that's lovely, so thank you. Um, you know, when, when I started to, I mean, when I started to write, um, started to write my books, um, I <coughs> always wrote the books that I wanted to read. And one of my heroes, Benjamin Disraeli, always said, you know, when I want to read a book, I write it. <laughs> and so as a sort of small tribute to Benjamin Disraeli, who, who is a character in this book, the Romanovs, as well as in my uh, Jerusalem history, um, I just, I, you know, I wanted to write, um, I wanted to find a book that had the whole Romanov dynasty in it, not just Nicholas and Alexander and Catherine <coughs> the Great, um, but all of them. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to, and I wanted to find something that covered everything in, in chronology with the family, diplomacy, war, arts. Um, and this is, of course, an insanely ambitious, um, ambi you know, ambitious project. But um, I loved many books. I mean, Bruce Lincoln's book on the on the Romanovs, for example. Is a fantastic book, and he's a titan of our age. Um, but it's a book that it, it, it's, it's, the, it's, it's not written in a single narrative, for those of you who know it well. Um, there's another, Lindsay Hughes, a late professor in England, also wrote a brilliant book on the Romanovs, and she, she hers is a kind of analysis. So no one had quite done this, and I wanted to find it, I couldn't find it, so I thought, what the hell, I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> and the trouble with being a writer and historian is that you, know, you write a paragraph <coughs> proposing these crazy ideas. And then about a couple of years later, your publisher says, well, are you, you know, are you going to do the bloody thing? And you have to. So this is, this is what I set out to do. I mean, I'd done Jerusalem, which was 5,000 years um, of history. So I guess for 350 years, it's kind of just about doable. But, you know, it's a challenge. What did I want to do when I did it? I wanted to write a book um, that was absolutely academically sound, you know, based not on the myth that you see in many, for those of you who read Russian history, I know everyone here does, you read the same stuff in book after book. I mean, for example, I had read, I'd read when I wrote my book on Catherine of Batem, I'd read so many books from Henry, Henri Troyer onwards repeating the same rubbish about Catherine the Great, <laughs> that, that it, no one had ever, and Potemkin especially, that, that no one had ever checked. So, but my first sort of mission is to go back to the sort of the original sources and try to work, try to find out, without prejudice, what really happened and how things really worked at court. 
And court is important because court was the entrepot of prizes and power, that, you know, and it still is everywhere. If you work in, if you work in an office, if you work in the president's, in the over, you know, if you work in the White House, if you work in the Prime Minister's office in England, even though there aren't um, flunkies and hierarchies and uniforms, power always works in the same way. So you can look at this book as an explanation of why is Russia Russia? How did Russia become Russia today? Why is Russia exceptional? Why Putin? Why Ukraine? Why Syria? Why Crimea? You know, all these things. But also, I, I, I wanted to write something which was a, a study of power and how power, and all my books are like that to a certain extent. And what the hell, if you, if you wanted to read it just as a family saga, that's fine too. Because I want to write my books that are accessible to everybody and not just to, not just to academics. Of course, it's a family like no other, except the Caesars, perhaps. I mean, this is a family where fathers torture their sons to death, where sons have their fathers overthrown and murdered upstairs, and so on. Where Catherine the Great destroys her husband and takes the throne. So, I guess it's just, a, it's just an ordinary family story. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this then, since we'll do high and low. Let me start with, uh, with, uh, with another high. Um, 304 years of uh, uninterrupted growth, which actually began before the Romanovs even came to power, is a stunning uh, story. No country, no people, no dynasty uh, ended up presiding over such steady growth and maintained a contiguous empire for nearly as long. Um, Alexander the Great has, had his day and the empire fell apart after his death. There were rulers from uh, the Far East and Central Asia. No one managed to cobble together and pull together such a territory. Can you speak a little bit to what you found in the process of researching for this book, and of course others? Was there a secret to the Romanovs? What did they do right? Well, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Of course, it's one of the billion dollar questions. I mean, what, what's interesting is that you know, the reputation of the, of the Romanovs is that um, they were a sort of cursed dynasty um, who, who ended up being somewhat tragic, pathetic, whatever you like to call it, you know, isolated, rigid, whatever you like to, like to call it. But of course, I was absolutely right. I mean, they were actually the most successful dynasty of modern times. Um, even, you know, Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, all of them conquered great empires, which sort of vanished within, within, de within their own lifetime or the end of their lives. So, so what was successful? Well, well first of all, um, with sort of, with, with large, you, you, when you look at, when you read the book, you see that there are, there are several tectile occasions where you kind of think like, if this czar is so incompetent and so depraved and so distracted from business, how can the country have continued to run? How, did, how was the country successful? And yet it was. So that is the big question. And, I mean, essentially, the czar, the Romanov, the Romanov family, the, 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 the czars, created an alliance with the nobility that proved, um, proved kind of unbreakable. I mean, when, the, when, the Roman, when, when they come, uh, Michael I was chosen in 1613, from then on, essentially, with, with, with the rare um, moment in 1825, the Decemberist revolt, the alliance with, 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 with the nobility lasted right up until the emancipation of the, of the serfs. And, you know, the deal was that um, the nobility had absolute power over their serfs and their estates, and in return, they would back the dynasty. And generally, everyone was so terrified at what had happened in the time of troubles that they were willing, they, they were willing just to, to, ought to accept that the dynasty was the legitimate dynasty. And that alliance proved incredibly successful. Militarily, of course, um, you know, serf soldiers proved were, were probably, and this is subject to sort of fascinating research all the time, which, you, which I'm sure you follow, but, you know, Russia could put an army into the field more cheaply than probably any other country. You know, they could pay their serfs less, feed them less, they could march further. Um, and this made a huge difference in, in armies that were essentially manpower and horse based. And of course, that lasted. So the success really lasted. Um, and, of course, and of course, they had a vast population as well. So this endured right up until, until the Crimean War when you know, the Industrial Revolution kind of caught up with the Russian Empire. So I think that that is the answer for some of the success. I mean, the other one is just the weakness of the countries around it and what befell them. Um, a series of child monarchs in Sweden, um, which overstretched itself. 
um, Poland, which gradually destroyed itself by having an elective monarchy, an insanely self-destructive constitution, no wonderful and noble as it may be. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, the fragmentation of the, the former Genghis, Genghisid Empire, which broke up into Khanates that could be that could be swallowed in, in, little, in little bites, Kazan, Astrakhan, and then it ultimately uh, uh, you know, Crimea and the um, and the Khanate there. So I think those are some of the reasons for for the success. Did you happen to reflect much on uh, Russian national identity and how it was reflected by the Romanovs? Because one of the remarkable things about uh, uh, Russia's national identity and reverberations of that we see today um, is that uh, imperial uh, expansion uh, went hand in hand from the get-go with what it meant to be mm -hmm. Russian. There was never a, um, uh, a mother country with distant colonies. Everything grew, uh, you know, uh, attached to uh, the center. And the Russian elite always intermarried with the locals. There was never a racist uh, uh, undertow uh, to Russian imperialism, although there was plenty of violence, as there is in all imperialism. Uh, any conclusions that you came to about Russian national identity in the process of research? Well, you're right. I mean, one of the interesting things that you'll you'll see in the, you'll see in the book is that you know if you look at Ivan the Terrible's court from Ivan the Terrible until Alexei um, Mikhailovich's reign, you know, if you look at the very very top people in the Russian court, you know, the, the Boyars Council and so on, I mean, a, a large proportion of them were of Tatar origin or were intermarried with Tatars or were or were literally converted, nat naturalized Tartar Zaroviches and princes. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you're absolutely right that you know, at first it really wasn't a sort of, uh, even though there was always an awareness of Russianness, um, you know, it wasn't, a race, it, wasn't a race, it wasn't about racial superiority at all, it was more about orthodox superiority. And I think that was the running theme. Where, this, where it all started to go wrong, is in the 19th century, I think, mm -hmm. where, the, where, where as, 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 as nationalism was unleashed, the Romanov struggled between the idea, which I think this is what you're getting at, is the idea of a multinational, multi-ethnic empire, albeit dominated by Russian families, Russian nobility, Russian, you know, mm -hmm. Russianness. Um, they struggled between this multinational empire with its Poles, Jews, Finns, Georgians, and so on, mm -hmm. and Russian nationalism. And from Nicholas I onwards, especially, you know, they, they struggled with these two concepts. They tried to run them in parallel. And as time went on, um, the, the, you know, the, I think the idea of the national czar gradually started to win out. And that was a terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. um, maybe an irresistible one. But it meant that by the end of the century, um, you know, anti-Polish policies, anti-Semitism, all of these things were so institutionalized that gradually, you know, in fact, Prince Michael Vorensel said, you know, these are the most idiotic and pharaonic policies. You know, you're, you're alienating huge swathes of incredibly cultured, hardworking people. And so it was, because in fact, you know, for example, if you take the Jews, not the Poles, who, 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 who were always waiting for their moment to escape from the evil empire, but if you look at the Jews, you know, they adopted the Tsar. They were incredibly keen to sort of make it in Russian society, but they weren't allowed to. And by the sort of by the, by the 1890s, you know, they were they were essentially an alienated, you know, six million alienated people at the heart of the you know in the empire. And they therefore anti-Semitism became a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, you know, the Tsars have been the, the Tsars have treated the Jews in such a way that by the end the Jews were all opponents of Tsardom. And many became revolutionaries. And many became you revolutionaries. Know. And you know, I just done an interview for for CSPAC where I've only said like, so you got Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky. Were they? You know, who, how many of them were Jewish? You know, and of course, you know that that that's, that sort of those reasons. Just look at their ethnicities. Sum up, um, you know, the, the the problem of late Tsardom. You know, a Georgian, um, a Jew. And somewhat of mixed Tatar Russian and Jewish descent. Yeah. And that sort of sums it up. And of course, you know, these policies were, 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 were sort of idiotic, but but they were a fetish. I want to follow up on the uh, on your criticism of uh, policy. I was um, I was impressed because I happen to agree with your take on Nicholas II. 
as a, uh, the wrong man at the wrong time with a very unfortunate combination of characteristics. Can you speak a little bit more to your portrait of Nicholas II? Most of us are used to the romanticized version. Yes. It comes from the Masseys, yeah. both of them, by the way. Um, you are a lot more realistic and stark. Yeah, I mean, this is, that's, that's a good, great question. I mean, of course, I grew up with the Robert Massey books, and it's impossible not to mention him, and, and glory in him as a, as, a, as a noble titan of our age. Um, but... Um, but I, I, I sort of disagree with the romantic approach mm -hmm. um, to Nicholas and Alexandra. I mean, I think in a sense, it's infantilizing to them for a start. Um, of course, they were a romantic couple who were very in love with each other. Um, of course, um, they, 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 had, they struggled to find the male heir. Um, that struggle um, you put enormous pressure on both of them after four daughters. They finally got... Zarevich and Lexi, who had haemophilia, their decision to hide that disease and keep it a secret, which was understandable, um, uh, the lack of knowledge about the disease, their insistence that this boy must inherit the throne, and not just the throne, but the full plenitude of sort of medieval autocracy. All of these decisions find in themselves placed immense pressure not only on the child, but on themselves, and made them, and, and, gave, and, and, opened, and opened an opportunity to people like Rasputin, who, by the way, I'm quite sympathetic to. I'm not a sort of hater of Rasputin. Um, we can talk about him later, perhaps. But, but Nicholas and Alexandra um, are, much, are much more than just those family things, just, just being members of a family. Um, they were politicians, though they despised politics. Um, they were, they, they, were all, they, were, they, were, they were autocrats, and an autocrat is in the business of politics. Um, Nicholas didn't seek the throne, and in fact, it's one of the features of the book that before 1796, everybody wanted to be Tsar or Tsarina, and people would do anything to get the job. And after 1801, no one wanted it anymore. <laughs> and in fact, you know, there's not a single person, even Alexander III, who was you know, actually a sort of titanic figure. Um, there's not a single person who didn't burst into tears when they found out they were going to be Tsar, <laughs> which tells you something about how hard it is to be Tsar, how difficult it is to rule Russia, and how both those things became harder as time went on. So that, that's interesting. But once he'd taken the oath, Nicholas II, despite regularly kind of whining that he hadn't been prepared for the throne and it was his father's fault, which he said frequently, Actually, auto, auto, autocrat is a job that no one can be prepared for. There really is no education. I mean, you can read history and meet lots of, lots of you know, um, senior officers and talk to foreign ministers and lawyers and so on. But actually, a um, bit of education helps, yes. But actually, you have to learn on the job. Nothing can prepare you for the vast diversity of demands called upon to be a czar. When in, a job for which you had to be field marshal, generalissimo, pope, patriarch, prime minister, president, um, you know, I could go on, you know, landowner, uh, I mean, you could, you could name about 10 thick, thick jobs that you had to be a master of. And as, and as both Alexander II and Alexander I said, that no one but a genius is actually qualified to do this job. Mm -hmm. And how many families have any of those? You know, this family managed to throw up at least two and quite a lot of incredibly able people, by the way, more than a given rate, you get that like, given credit for. So Nicholas, once he'd become Tsar and he'd taken the oath, um, though frequently complaining he wasn't prepared and you know, he didn't trust his ministers, actually became absolutely dedicated in a, to an extent that the romantic image doesn't really give to keeping this autocracy um, exactly as it was, and in fact taking it backwards um, to pre-Peter the Great, um, uh, to, to pre pre the great ideas of monarchy. And to do that, um, he became highly political, and his political senses, uh, he, he was extremely jealous of any ministers who became more powerful than him. Um, he was extremely duplicitous in the way he handled ministers. And I know that um, this isn't what the, the analysis you'll usually find of him. Um, he, he was hated by his ministers, and all of them, if you read all of them, they said, he's going to be another Paul. I can't trust him. He doesn't... See, it wasn't just that he was weak. It was also that 
he undermined them. And as he said himself, you know, well, my, my policy is basically to say yes to something and then do what I wanted all along, <laughs> which, of course, is a did cat catastrophic way to run a government. Um, he constantly ran um, <coughs> private advisors against his own government, which Louis XV had tried, as we know, in, in, the, in, the, in the secret, the king's secret, was similarly a sort of disastrous way of running. I mean, all leaders, all presidents, all prime ministers, all kings have private envoys who they send out and people they speak to in secret in kitchen cabinets. Um, every president does. But to actually run a government counter to your government while lying to your ministers to their faces is an insane way to conduct yourself in the, in the early 20th century, in the 20th century. So these were all problems. Then his views um, were fairly appalling. Um, you know, the anti-Semitism had reached, which he, Alexander III was rapidly anti-Semitic. I mean, Alexander III, you know, when, when a train went too slowly, I mean, he famously said, like, what is this, a Yid line? Is it driven by Jews? Why is the train going too slowly? So, you know, this is sort of insane, sort of um, in, insane prejudice, which, you know, Nicholas II, Nicholas II, if you read in the book, you know, I, I gathered together all of the evidence of this. Um, it, it's pretty shocking. And absolutely, he was pretty brutal when he, when he, when he put down the 1905 and 1907 revolution. Again, you know, some of the memos he was sending and the orders he was given, if I, if I put Lenin's name beside them, you know, you would not, you know, you would not, you would not be able to tell one from the other. And he's saying kill thousands, you know, shoot thousands of them, and so on. So, this isn't this isn't Nicholas Alexander we wouldn't recognise from the Romantic view, um, but equally, um, he's a man who loved his wife. He was faithful. He was the most faithful of the Romanovs, that's for sure. Um, he was so the most. Was his father. He, he was the most. And they, him and his father were both very exorious, um, loved their children, <coughs> loved their private life, and so on. The trouble was that an emperor could not really have a private life, and you had to recognise that nothing that there was not a division between public and private in an autocracy. And so, in not understanding this. He failed to understand one of the essential things. Though he was obsessed with autocracy, he was a believer in autocracy, um, and wanted to perpetuate it and save it for his son, he had failed to understand that having an advisor like Rasputin, for example, um, could be a problem. And you know, the thing about Rasputin, which again is new in this book, I think, is it, it wasn't just about him being able to heal or calm the, the son, the child, with this terrible illness. Um, Though he could do that. Now, whether you, whether you believe in faith healing, um, or whether you believe he was, a, he was a holy man, is a decision for you. Um, what he could certainly do was calm the mother down, which I think in this case was, a, was probably as important as staunching the bleeding and calming the child. But when you look carefully at what he said, what the, what the Tsar said about him, I think you'll see that he was much more than just the healer of the child. He was the conciliary, the confessor, the crutch, um, the advisor, the friend, and the, and the authentic fulfillment of Nicholas Alexander's idea of what it was to be a czar. He was, they believed that you had to cut out everything that Peter the Great had done, the modern world of um, Jews and Englishmen and, and foreigners, and Petersburg with its kind of decadent society. And you needed to go back to the essence of the relationship that made Russia great, which we were talking about earlier, czar and peasant. Mm -hmm. um, Rasputin, they met him in 1905 at the very moment that that entire belief was being challenged on every side catastrophically by revolution. And at that very moment, they met this peasant, this charismatic, fascinating, intelligent peasant um, who, who fulfilled and who was the authentic fulfillment of that vision. And they basically fell in love with him in a way. Um, they believed in him um, and they needed him. They needed him to constantly remind them that this, that this authentic vision was real. And Nicholas was as dependent on him in his way as she was. She more so, perhaps. And um, if he'd stayed out of politics and stayed as a private faith healer and a friend of the family, that would have been fine. But then World War One came. And that's all she wrote. That's all she wrote. <laughs> Listen, we are we do want to leave some time yeah. for questions. I did want to ask you, however, about there are many novelties in this book, and one of the most interesting ones is the correspondence between Alexander II and Ekaterina Catherine uh, Bilgarukova. 
uh, his uh, mistress and then uh, uh, potentially uh, wife. Yeah. Um, what did you discover in those letters? Very racy correspondence, very yeah. unusual yeah. correspondence. Yeah. This correspondence, that, that's a nice question. I mean, this correspondence, there, there are quite a few new things in the book, as you say. Right? I think yeah. this, is, this is the biggest thing, in the fact that it was 3,000 letters. But the bits of them have appeared, they were a red bit. But the whole lot has not really been, been, um, been published. It's never been published, and most of it has never been read by, um, by historians. I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it's the most extraordinary correspondence you will ever read. I mean, first of all, it's romantic, it's intimate, it's increasingly political as the years go by, um, but it is also the most sexually explicit correspondence written by a head of state in all of history. <laughs> it, is, um, it contains stuff. It contains sexual acts that I didn't think had been invented until the 21st century. And here they are in the 1860s and 70s. Now, I don't know you well enough. It was a liberal czar, right? He was a very well, liberal czar. <laughs> I don't know you well enough to tell you what these are, but if you work it out, um, do Facebook, write to me on Facebook or Twitter or something, and tell me if you work out. Um, but they're also extraordinarily moving because, you know, you realise that this Tsar is going to be assassinated, they're doomed, and though you must write these books, especially with Nicholas Alexandra and Alexander II, and, and, and in fact, you know, with all the assassinated Tsars, essentially, you've got to write it as if you don't know what is going to happen, because that is a great fatal flaw, if to write everything, everything's an omen of what's about to happen. I find that very boring. So in each case, I write it as if it isn't inevitable, because actually it isn't. There were, so, there were so many kind of chances that made these things. I mean, especially with the terror, especially with the terrorist attack. You know, um, if you're, if like Emperor Paul, your entire staff and government and all your friends and your children and wife have decided that you're going to be murdered, yeah. then that's not that's not a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> then it is going to happen sometime. But with with terrorists hunting a public personage, there are a lot of chances about whether these things succeed. Um, but this correspondence is extraordinary. They called, they called sex bingoli, which I think is a German word. I can't find out what it came from, but that is their word. As we all know, all lovers and husbands and wives have private names for these things. They had a lot of names um, for everything. They did a lot of everything. In fact, in his 60s, the do his do Alexander II's doctors had to say that, you know, Having sex four times in two hours is too much. <laughs> and also having sex with every piece of furniture in your entire palace could exhaust you. Could you have some days off? And in the letters, they discuss this and they say, they, they say that we, we're trying to have a day off, but we simply cannot wait for four o'clock. Never mind having a day off. So it's a wonderful correspondence. It hasn't really been used before. This is the thing, this is the reason why. I mean, the, the, by the way, in, in the sort of... It becomes increasingly political. At first, it's just about them, and like all secret lovers, they're loving the fact that across a crowded court, they can see each other. And there are great sort of discussions of like, you know, I, 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 when he says like, you know, I, that dance, I danced, I had to dance with ten ladies in waiting before I could dance with you, just so I could dance with you. And or you know, I saw you across the whole sort of room, and we looked at each other, and I just or or at a wedding. Um, they, they look at each other across the, across the huge sort of church, and they're both thinking, "Wish we could be married, getting married." And there are lots of wonderful things. Even even as I say it, my hair stands on end. What hair I have, um, <laughs> because it's so kind of passionate. But it has a selfish side, of course, because they're also his wife had to die for this to happen. In a small detail, um, and when it did, when she did die, it did happen. But the, the letters become increasingly political during the war, the 1877-1878 war. The letters become even more fascinating because he's talking about, you know, Plevna, mm -hmm. um, the disastrous conduct of his brother, you know, the command of his brother, um, Nicholas Michalovich, and so on. And so it becomes increasingly military, political, and, he's, and, and, and it mixes up the sex with politics. So it sort of says, like, God, I hate that fat old slut Queen Victoria. Um, <laughs> when can I have sex with you again? <laughs> <laughs> he, says, he says, we're about to take Constantinople. We're, we're a day from taking it, but the British fleet are outside. God, I hate Israeli. Um, I've got to have you again. I mean, <laughs> so it goes on like this. The reason why, the and I'm not exaggerating, if you're, when you see, when, it, when, it, when, it, when, it, when I found this, I went back to my wife and I'd say to her, like, 
Can I just read to you what's in here? And she goes, right. She said, are you making this stuff up? <laughs> but um, it's tragic, too, because the letters go right up to his assassination. Mm. She begs him not to go out that day. Mm. On that day, he is about to sign a constitution, a form of constitution, we should say. Not, though it's always called it, he called it a constitution. But in fact, it was far from what we'd call an American constitution. It wasn't really, it wasn't really anything very democratic, but it was still could have st would have changed history, I think. And only he could have done that. And so the death, all of this, um, has a sort of very serious side to it. Um, these letters, are, the reason why they're not published is very quickly, because I know we've got a, we've got a, we've got a, a in one questions. minute, yeah. And we'll have questions, and it's just, it's just an interesting story. You know, when she left, um, when, when he was assassinated, his widow, Katya left and went to live in Paris, and she took these letters with her, most of them. Some were kind of stolen and sold, and so that's why packets of them have been published and you'll have read them. Um, but the great mass of them stayed together, and they remained in private hands until 1998, oh, wow. when um, the French Rothschild family, banking dynasty, <laughs> bought them. And they had a reason. Because in 1945, Stalin's Red Army had captured the Rothschild banking archives which had been in Vienna and had been taken to Berlin. Mm. And he captured them and took them, to the, put them in the Russian archives, where no one was at all interested in them, of course. And they're, they're probably very boring. Not the, half as interesting as the correspondence. <laughs> yeah. But they bought the correspondence in 1998, and they offered it. They said, we bought the Tsar's correspondence. If you, if we, if we, can we do a swap? And the Elkson government agreed, and so the swap was done. So in about 2000, they arrived in the archives. And they haven't been completely... They haven't really been completely sorted. So um, there's one girl in the Russian archives I, I met who I noticed was working on the same thing. So as, my, or even, as one does when one sees these things, one's heart sinks. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I'm like, well, what are you, what are you, what are you well, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. What are you doing? What are you doing? And you're terrified they're going to say, um, my name's um, Robert Massey. I'm writing a book. <laughs> um, but in fact, she was a Russian girl, and she was just one person who's writing about this correspondence and is researching it. But they're not, they're unpublished, and they're untranslated, and so on. So, so, um, so I was very lucky with that. And there are, there are quite a few other things in this book. I mean, particularly about the conspiracy of the, to murder Paul. There's a there's an doc, amazing document which has not really been used before, which was in France which tells the story of how they killed him and, and how the conspiracy, which is absolutely gripping. And there's a lot of other stuff, but anyway, um, that's it. I, I guess we should have some, we should. Let's do questions, because we want to end promptly at 4.30 for book signing. So um, Hans and Masha will bring around the microphone, so off we go. Let's do, should we take just a few at a time, or would you prefer one at a time? Let's do one at a time, let's, let's do, do one at fast. Time. Okay, really fast. First of all, this is absolutely fabulous. And I have a suggestion for your next book. Back to Rush, back to Russia. Get those get those love letters. Yeah. And, and do a book just as if you're writing it, you're reading it to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice but, idea. But uh, can you can you elaborate a little bit more on the on the records? How difficult was it was to deal with this kind of scope? You mentioned, you know, five thousand years on in you know, Jerusalem. Hey, what do we have here? You know, yes. what did you have to do to get this kind nice of Nice question. Thing? Yeah, nice question. I mean, these books, these books are a nightmare to do, I have to tell you. Um, I mean, you basically don't sleep for three years as you try, and, you, know, you try and amass all this material. Because as time went on, with the first couple of czars, you know, there's not much material in fact. There's actually, though, Tsar elected the second of the dynasty, kept enormous notebooks and wrote it. But even so, you know, it's even though there are, you know, there are volumes of his, of his correspondence, in fact. By the time you reach the late 19th century, you know, there are, there are, there are, there are 50 grand dukes. There are each one of them, um, and there are many, men, there's a full government, and every one of them is keeping a diary, has a mistress, has a wife, has many children, has children by his mistress, other mistresses. Um, but then there's, you know, there's a full government with, you know, um, ministers of the Navy, ministers of armed foreign ministers, all of them keeping notes, all of them writing memos. And as a, a, those of you who work in Washington and if any of you work in government know, you know, the vast amount of paper being being kind of vomited forth um, by the bureau by, by government bureaucracy became too much 
um, for even the, the Tsars to hand work. I mean, basically, they, after Nicholas I, no Tsar managed to work out a way to be an autocrat and to master this stuff. But well, anyway, I had to master it, but I, but I at least could choose the bits that I found most interesting. But it is a hell of a job, and um, it almost killed me. It almost killed me. And now it's just fun not, not working, but just talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, quick comment on the question. Um, you evoked Israeli, who wrote his own book. Uh, you had another prime minister, Winston Churchill, who said history will treat me kindly because I intend yeah. to write it. I don't know whether you're going that far. Um, I had several, but, but I'll... Um, um, you talked about, and I haven't hadn't occurred to me before how desperate uh, Nicholas and Alexander were to have a male heir, but there was precedent, not, uh, <coughs> not just Catherine the Great, that was unusual, but there was precedent for empresses to succeed by, uh, uh, by lineage, uh, just part of the dynasty, so why, uh, why weren't there daughters <coughs> of, uh, what was the change. Well, it's a good, it's good, that's a very good question. Um, the two key answers. One is, uh, well, there are three answers. First of all, the female, the female rulers of Russia hadn't been an unqualified success. Well, neither were um, the males. No, nor were the males, for that matter. <laughs> but then they had some incredibly remarkable, remarkable statement. And Elizabeth is, is, I think, greatly underrated. Mm -hmm. despite, despite her taste, I mean, she really laid the foundations for the Russian Empire for its successes of Catherine. For the, for the ability of Catherine to rule as a woman. Interesting. So she's kind of hugely under it. I mean, Catherine I was a bit of a disaster. Anna was a kind of Game of Thrones villainess. Um, Anna Leopold Osno, who lived in a kind of lesbian um, menage a trois with her lover. And, and again, there's some letters, there's some interesting letters in there that, that, that are unpublished that show how complicated her um, bedroom life, menage were. Um, had been a bit of a disaster. So that you're right, that someone's been a successful. Paul I had changed the law of succession, is the kind of key reason in 1796. So that though there could be female um, rulers only if all the male um, Romanovs were extinct, which they would never have they would never have been for Nicholas and Alexander, because there were hundreds of by that point there were, as I said, I think about fifty male grand dukes or something crazy, weren't there? So so they would have it was designed to avoid female because Emperor Paul hated his mother. Yes. And the third thing is that um, the third thing is that um, there's evidence that Nicholas II did, for a moment, consider making Olga heir. There's, there's an interesting essay about this, and you know there was some talk of you know should that happen. And of course, he would have had to face that if he hadn't, if the fifth child hadn't been a son. You know, they would have had to think what the hell to do about it. And so that was that was a possibility. Um, and um, but. But they were dead set against it, and they were determined that this child, this son they'd be given by God, regardless of his illness, regardless of the fact that autocracy was visibly failing, they were determined that he must inherit all of it. So, so that, that's the reason. You know, you know, two more questions that I know I've seen, and then a third. All right. Thank you. Aaron Cohen, the Planning Council. Oh. Um, I'm a great admirer of your work. Uh, I think the Stalin books were terrific. Uh, the one that really stands out is Stalin's mother's diary that you unearthed in Tbilisi, and you said that nobody read it because it was too dangerous to read. That's right, that's right. Uh, but uh, taking it, because this is Washington and, and we're looking at politics and stuff, uh, to what extent the swing under the current government in Russia away from identifying with Europe and creating this narrative of Russian civilization as something that is a part of Europe, a notion that would be probably alien in the, you know, since Peter the Great. Uh, how does the Romanov experience, in your view, <coughs> influence the thinking? Is it still relevant? Is the fact that uh, you have more and more elements of autocracy in Russia today uh, has roots uh, in the Romanov experience. So yeah, we, yeah, that's a good question. Can you talk about continuity and change, as we used to call it? Yes. Yeah. Well, I was just, Thank you. I was just a couple of days ago, and you're in the State Department here talking about this to sort of to the Russian desk. And I mean, that, 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 is, that is a great question. Um, 
the, the answer is that you know, the Peter the Great, um, Peter the Great, of course, turned Russia towards Europe. And actually, if you study everything, just, just to take that as an example, if you study everything he did, despite all his reforms, um, he actually kind of, he actually really concentrated, he, he really made sure that actually government was personal. You know, none of the institutions he created actually ever worked. You know, he always undermined them himself and family in every really way, you know, nothing was done. So, you know, he, all his great Swedish, German, English, you know, influence on the, how he arranged his collegiate stuff. So, in the 19th century, actually, there was a big swing backwards towards you know, Russianness, and that's what we really started off by talking about um, with, that, with Anton here, was, which was that you know autocracy, you know nationality autocracy, all this kind of thing, orthodoxy, Slavophilia. This was a kind of, in a way, a swing back away from kind of empire and back towards a sort of national idea of the state, national exceptionalism, and that was why someone like I don't know Dostoevsky so. Became, who'd been sort of sentenced to death by the Romanovs, in the end became a, a fan of autocracy, a national autocracy, you know. And so Putin's ideas of, sort of, of, of the Russian world, if you like, the exceptional Russian world, would have been much more friendly to Alexander III and Nicholas II than one might expect. And so that's the first answer. But the second one is that Putin has a really interesting view of of, of, of the Russian past, which is surprising to us because we're still so stuck in an ideological view of monarchy and communism. But he talks, he talk, thinks of things quite differently. Coming from, um, coming from his background, um, he, you know, at one point he said recently, you know, Lenin it was a disaster for Russia. But at the same time, he's often said, he's often talked about Stalin as a, you know, his, his textbooks talk about Stalin as a supremely efficient manager who had to do, you know, who had to do ruthless things in order to make Russia a great superpower. So, in other words, he regards the Stalin as a great success with a, with, with a high price, Lenin as a disaster. Um, that's an interesting thing. You know, there's that famous time when he talks about whether he's going to retire or not, and he says, you know, I'll never, I'll never retire, but I will, ne I certainly would never re re abdicate like Gorbachev and Nicholas II did. Both of them who left the country, you know, who betrayed the country by leaving, you know, by letting it fail. So, in other words, he's not really kind of thinking in terms of monarchy versus uh, communism and general secretaries. He's really thinking in terms of successful Russian statesmen. And so, he would rank sort of Peter the Great and Stalin, and then probably as the two of the greatest, followed by say Alexander the First and Nicholas the First, perhaps. Um, he. I know for a fact that he, I don't know if he's ever looked at any of my books except the first one, and which I believe he read, my one on Catherine and Petronica. <laughs> and when George W. Bush, who had also read it, because he gave, I, I don't know, I've never met either of these people, by the way, but they've both talked about it in an interview, so I, I, that's the only reason I know about this. But when they met, they talked about um, Petronica with, with, with some admiration. And when George W. Bush went to the went to meet uh, went to the Hermitage, he said to me, he said, and, and Putin said, I want to show you um, Peter the Great. He said, No, no, I want to see Pachonkin. So, <laughs> so and so Putin said, Ah, you know, and they talked about it. So, um, and I happen to know from several other sources that Putin was very interested in the Catherine the Great and Pachonkin's reign, which of course is not suitable for 20, 20 or twenty first century um, kind of uh, as as a sort of Sort of template for various reasons, you know, to do with <laughs> sex, aristocracy, and extravagance, basically, and femininity, of course, you know, which makes it, a, you know, which makes them an impossible basis for them. But he was very interested. So that's how he sees history. And by the way, one thing he does, which is interesting, is you know, when he when he goes into um, when he goes when he's in his office in in, in the Triangular Palace in um, in the Kremlin, he likes people to go in there and he says, close your eyes, run your fingers along the books. And choose a book and open it somewhere, and then open your eyes. And it, of course, they're Stalin's books. That half of Stalin's library is still in that <coughs> office, so the other half is in the archives. And then they look at what Stalin's written in the margin. <laughs> that doesn't quite answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> you did answer it. Maybe one more question. One more. Is that okay? okay? Given the two flags you're sitting in front of, I must ask you to talk a bit about the Romanos and America. Uh, I mean, we've had a, a complex mutual history of 
comprehension and miscomprehension, even going back to that period, and particularly how important they were in during the period of the American Civil War. Yeah. We're coming up on the 150th anniversary of the return of American naval visit to, uh, to, to Russia to sort of show thanks to them. But I was a little interested in your perspective of why the, they, they got that engaged in supporting the United States, uh, the North, during the Civil War. Was it just because they were trying to undercut the British and the French, uh, or were there, or were there other perceptions of what they were doing? Yeah, it's very ironic, isn't it? That you know they were supporting the North, they supported Lincoln, they sent, they sent the fleet, they sent the Russian fleet there, which was which you're referring to to, to visit, um, and the Alexander the Second really admired Lincoln, and Lincoln admired him. So that, that, that for a start, that's a touching relationship, and it went on, and it, afterwards, of course, um, there was the sort of the sale of Alaska. Um, and um, and you know a, 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 and they remained allies and he sent his son Grand Duke, Duke Alexis on an amazing barnstorming tour of America which which is one of those kind of hilarious forgotten incidents um, where Grand Duke Alexis you know who was a sort of I suppose a sort of 19th century version of Prince Harry um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, who kind of who was on went on tour and just behaved with charming um, abandon across Russia, <laughs> and having affairs with kind of a, a dancer, a burlesque dancer, a stripper in New Orleans, an actress in, in New York, um, went, on a, went on a great buffalo right. hunt with General Custer and um, <laughs> Buffalo Bill, and did, 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 did had a great time. And all the time, and by the way, he wrote to his mother, who was a very shockable and rather a boring woman, saying, um, you know, don't believe anything you read about me on my tour of America. He said, it, it, the press is inventing it all. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds terribly modern. But yeah, but, it, but I, think, I think part of it was, a lot of it was to do with the English. You know, England was the great enemy at that time. And um, and it's hard to imagine, given that they'd been allies in the, in the Napoleonic Wars, and given that we, in World War One they were allies, it's, it is to forget that they were absolutely lethal enemies at that, the whole middle of the 19th century. Absolutely hated each other, and that was an, that was a very important. You know, that was a very important um, part of it, I think. And um, but it was a really close relationship. Um, good. Thank you. I, I should probably just say thanks for brilliant chairmanship here. The being the czar of this event. Thank you so much. It's an election year. Expectations are low. Yeah. <laughs>